Hi. You know, it's, it's quite something being an American in the year 2021, because to the extent that you're in your 40s or your 30s, you've lived through an empire that was on the way up and at the peak after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, and then continued to be at the peak in 2000, as technology began taking over more and more of our lives. And of course, now that we're in the year 2021, during a time when China joined the WTO in 2001 and proceeded to create the largest middle class in the history of the world over the last 20 years, we're now, as Americans, able to see what, what it looks like, what it feels like to be in a country or an empire in decline. And I wanna talk about what it means to be an empire. Uh, on a fundamental basis, there's nothing inherently wrong with an empire. An empire is merely a mechanism to export products and services overseas. And in doing so, carry with those products and services overseas the ability to make rules and regulations favorable to the empire. So a lot of people wonder, why are lawyers in charge of a, of a Congress or a parliament in America? It's because a thing is not just a thing. It's a conduit that allows somebody somewhere to export their systems overseas or anywhere really. And so when we ship something overseas, we're not just shipping a product, we're shipping how we ship that product or service overseas and under what conditions we ship that product or service overseas. Now, obviously having a strong military helps. If you have a strong military, you get to create the terms and conditions of globalized trade because you're the one shipping the products. Those products are going to go from San Francisco, Vancouver, Hong Kong, all the way around the world, around South Africa, you know, through the Straits of Malacca, you know, maybe Manila, and so on and so forth, Kobe, Japan, etc. And if you're the military with the fastest ships that, for the most part, can be refueled at locations overseas that are friendly to you, and friendly not just in terms of, a, of an allegiance, but in terms of how to do things, then you can get those ships refueled through the locks of whatever port you, you want quicker than the competition. Not only because you can export your software and the security behind the software that, that is used to track all the things that we receive from overseas, coffee, oil, etc. Not only because you can use that software, but you can also use it in your language. So if I export Microsoft or an iOS or an Android, even though for the most part, Android hardware is made in South Korea, it's done in English. That forces people all over the world to listen to the United States and by, and by corollary, the United Kingdom. And of course, the United States was once colonized by Spain, France, and England. We see of the reason Quebec speaks French is because the French repelled Americans trying to come up. And it wasn't just Americans, there's a whole complicated history all over the world. Uh, but for the most part, Quebec has remained French because it, it managed to keep Canada away from the Americans who were intending on continuing their conquest or their acquisition north. That's what happens, by the way, when you have that same military that allows you to export under your terms and conditions. In most cases, the military wants to expand no matter what, even if it's not a good idea in order to eliminate competition. So you can see how the empire not only allows things to be exported, but also rules and regulations and also language and therefore
culture. With respect to foreign governments, you can see how if they have to speak your language in order to use your software, it also becomes in order to receive products that are the best and the highest quality. You can see how governments overseas might be more beholden to a foreign government, in this case, the United States, rather than their own domestic citizens. That is what we mean when we talk about colonization. And if you travel the world, going on a tangent, you will see the capital cities all over the world are different from everywhere else. And that's what we talk about when we talk about the farmers uh, not having their interests aligned with the city folk. And a lot of times when we talk about the city folk, you know, what we're really talking about are people that are tied into a globalized trading scheme that is completely different from the rural countryside, which for the most part produces the food that allows us to survive and the farmland and so on. So you have to remember number one, the most important thing about an empire is that it works only if you as the empire are using your influence to export the highest quality and the best products. If you're not using that influence, say in 1945, to build the best bridges in you know, overseas, to create processes in 1950 in Japan that allow for manufacturing to have the highest quality QA, quality control or QC. If you're not doing that, then suddenly this idea of globalized trade starts to look sketchy. And suddenly that ability, ability to install regulations, to install your way of doing things, whether it's software or something else. And by the way, the software, of course, <laughs> gathers data. And of course, we know that data is extremely valuable, not just for, for intelligence purposes, but for just determining what people want. That's how governments stay in power. They balance what people want with what they need and how they can provide these things in a way that's sustainable. And you create all these different globalized structures and alliances based on the statement that we, the empire, are going to come into a place that is for the most part barren or destroyed, either because of war or neglect. We're going to build it. And when we build it, we're going to put you, the weaker country with a weaker military, under our banking system. You're going, to, you're going to be in debt under our currency. You're going to pay us back in our currency. And the consequence of that is that you're going to devalue your own labor. Because for the most part, you're not going to create semiconductors right away. You're not going to create high value items right away. You're going to, you're going to make socks. You're going to make hats. You're going to make something very simple. But once you perfect that, then you can move up the supply chain. You can see how these alliances work very well in, say, Germany, post-World War II, and Japan, post-World War II, when the empire in place is really in place because of merit, because of doing things the right way. And doing things the right way, in a tangible sense, creates both high security and high value in services and everything else. And if you don't have that foundation of being the best in terms of things and services, suddenly your culture is also going to be suspect. Because if you don't have the ability to say, I'm going to export the best and highest quality of everything, I'm going to figure out how to do so under the terms and conditions that I'm in charge of, that also are backed up by my data that allows me to figure out that say Georgia might be a great place to for agriculture to export something that maybe a nearby ally doesn't have access to. You can see how all these things coming in work to the extent that one day your Germany, the Russians have marched into Berlin, you're a destroyed country, and yet <laughs> 45 years later, you're a first world country for the most part, and even 70 years later, 
you are the leader for the most part in many, 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 many things, but especially manufacturing. It's not a coincidence because the empire at that point was helping create a globalized system of trade that allowed everyone to benefit. If suddenly you're not in a position where you're able to export the best, then the tendency, the temptation to install governments overseas based on bribes, based on something other than merit, something other than high quality, becomes too tempting. It creates a situation where suddenly these governments overseas are loyal to you, but not, but lacking the foundation of the empire that I just talked about. And becomes for the most part, a situation where corruption is guaranteed. So we see that there's nothing inherently wrong with an empire, but empires tend to work like monopolies. That's one of the reasons why almost every empire that has a strong military, they go together. They almost always fail because they almost always overextend themselves. And they overextend themselves for the most part because they have to. At some point, they have to create a monopoly. If they don't have a monopoly, then suddenly the same people whose value, whose labor value has been devalued because you're putting them in your currency, which is stronger. And that means that your home base benefits from other people's labor, but in an unequal way, which is fine as long as everyone's benefiting. If that's the situation that comes in, you wake up one day and eventually you're partners. You've, you can look at it in the sense that you've married, you're a millionaire in 1945, and you've married somebody who's 18 years old, doesn't have an education, doesn't have any property, from a, a bodega somewhere. And you just, that's fine, there's nothing inherently wrong with that relationship. But if she's 36 years old and hasn't gotten anywhere, then there is a problem there's probably gonna be a divorce. That's what we call a breakup, right? We call it a dissolution of say the Soviet Union. So all this is based on a foundation where the military seeks a monopoly, whether it's oil, that's been the story of the 20th century, getting a monopoly over oil, which is the largest or the most traded commodity in the world. And that's why, for the most part, militaries and countries overextend themselves. Because they're trying to get a monopoly. And in this case, there's no antitrust. There are no regulators to regulate an empire. That's the benefit of being in an empire. That sets the rules and conditions of trade. That's why the United States, remember what I said, oil is the largest traded commodity. Mexico and Canada have plenty of oil. The wages are nowhere near, for the most part, the United States. The quality of life or their ability, their ability to actually create terms and conditions and impose them on other countries is nowhere near the United States. Canada, despite having water, oil, plenty of land, small population, is for the most part in the same boat as other countries like Norway and Singapore. Very successful, but in a very limited way that does not allow a projection of their country's culture or country's products. We would still, for the most part, be wearing Nikes rather than Canada Goose or Roots. And that's despite the fact that for the most part, these products are made, you know, say in Mexico, right? and or overseas and it's despite the fact that when you travel you notice very quickly that the brand name doesn't really matter it's the manufacturing location that matters when it comes to quality it's just that that brand name represents something it represents qc it represents qa it represents a reputation it says i'm going to charge you more and you're going to work for me for less because I'm going to help you create the best products and the highest quality products. Behind all that will be a legal system that is honest and transparent that helps enforce contracts in a way that prevents corruption or at least minimizes it. 
all these things go together and that legal system is backstopped by our banking system. So yes, you are gonna work for me for less, but if you need to enforce a contract, we're gonna help you do it. If you need to create a situation where you're spending less on your military than the empire, that's fine because we will be there to protect not necessarily you, but your natural resources and all the manufacturing plants that we've built overseas that will be used within this globalized trading structure. And all that works because the foundation is designed to minimize corruption and is designed to export things of high quality. And again, the problem is what do you do when you have competition? So suddenly those lower wages, relatively speaking, allow an, a, comp, a competitor to rise up and offer similar products at a lower cost. And that's where there are now issues because to the extent that you have a partnership, suddenly that 18 year old beauty queen realizes, hey, you know, I don't need to be with this 50 year old guy and she's not 18 anymore. Let's say, you know, she's 25. I don't need to be with this guy. I know what he knows. I spent the last 10, 15 years, whatever I owe him, you know what? I paid my dues. I paid the debts back. Germany, by the way, was paying World War II debt all the way through, I think the 1990s. Now, it didn't hinder them, obviously, because again, the 20th century really was an era where the United States, with respect to things, tangible things, was able to export a way of doing it, way of manufacturing, that for the most part was the best way. That is all suspect now, when you've got a building in Miami, that's a condo that, that, that collapses. Suddenly that legal system doesn't make any sense and everything else that's connected together begins to look suspicious in terms of being the best. And now that 25 year old or that 30 year old beauty queen hopefully has an education by now, is looking at this old guy that she's been with and saying to herself, I'm not really growing, I'm still making socks. I'm still cooking, I'm still making food, I'm still doing agriculture. Those semiconductors over there look pretty good. That software looks pretty good. I, I don't know why I can't do it. This old guy can do it too. Why can't I? And that's where the seeds of divorce come in to the extent that you're not building and growing together. There's nothing really wrong with an unequal relationship as long as both people are growing. And a Singaporean once remarked that social cohesion is really based not on an elevator, but on an escalator. And, you know, you can, you know, a lot of people on an escalator are at different levels, but no one minds as long as everyone's moving up. And that is, on a fundamental level, what makes the banking system work. Because a currency, to the extent, to the extent that it's global, and really it has to be global if you want to be an empire, only works if everyone on that escalator is moving up. It doesn't work any other way. And so when you have competition, suddenly that whole structure that I just talked about is imperiled because now you've got essentially an ally that can do it just as well as you can at a lower cost. But that ally still has to use your software, still has to speak the language. When I fly a plane into a different airport, another country's airport, use their airspace. Remember that part of that military alliance involves using the software that powers not just an air force of a foreign country, but your domestic air routes and airspace as well. So suddenly, if you, if you have to share all of that, it becomes tumultuous. Are we going to have a system where you've got two different, you've got one part of the system that's used to, to allow Chinese pilots to enter the country in the same airport and another system for the Europeans and the Americans? Or are we going to have systems that are splintered along different lines because 
the international community, community no longer respects the international rule of law because they think it's biased in favor of the old empires and not the upcoming ones. That is where we are now in 2021. And the response of the empire, remember, has always been to seek a monopoly through, to maintain a monopoly through military adventurism and military excursions. That always fails. Inflation, I mean, it, it always fails, especially now. When, you know, an F-16 can be taken down by probably a million, a couple of million dollars worth of drones. So especially now, it doesn't work anymore. And so the response now has been to print money and to buy allies, essentially to buy friends. And that's what I talked about before. That currency strength allows you to buy governments, to install foreign governments. But unless the foundation is still there of merit, eventually the empire collapses. And what we're seeing now is thankfully the United States is not engaging in excessive military or additional military excursions, but it is attempting to spend its way into its status. Because if you don't have a highest quality product, if I can come to you and say, well, you know, we might not have the best software or the most functioning, secure software, but you accept it, I'll build a school for you over here. I'll donate money to the, to the UN or the USAID, or whatever nonprofit I've got going under my wing. And, you know, maybe we don't have the best product, but, you know, we can start doing other things for you. And you'll still be moving up on that, on that escalator. Is that going to work? That's just some, that's the strategy that the United States has right now, for the most part. And again, is it going to work? History says no. History says that, especially when you're in a country that is an empire that is segregated as much as the United States has been domestically, that cultural understanding and social cohesion tend to be more difficult to maintain and require more than just money. And where do we go from here? You can see that the United States is using those same legal systems, those same tariffs, those same rules and regulations to try to prevent competition, to maintain that monopoly by preventing China from extending its influence by offering its products, which again, are probably cheaper to buy because of that wage differential that is always inherent in an empire status. And let's say the money approach doesn't work. What should the United States do? That's a really difficult question. And I think that you know, for the most part, everyone almost always takes the path of least resistance. That's why the United States is trying to spend its way out of this competition problem. But in, in an ideal world, what should the United States do? What should failing empires do when faced with competition? The way that has worked, but has also been expensive, is to co-opt the competition. So you look at the Russians and you look at, say, Dagestan or Chechnya. Uh, you look at all over the world where you have breakaway movements. In many cases, if you don't want a military situation, a war, in many cases, what ends up happening is you simply buy them out. And that is similar to what I'm doing. You buy them out to give yourself time to catch up and to put everyone back on that escalator. And, you know, but in, the idea isn't the money. The idea is to co-opt competition. So you've got enough, you've got a party that is offering something that you because of dissatisfaction or something that you can't offer, you come in and say, you know what, maybe they're right, but give us some more time. We've got the, we still have the money. We still have the power to reduce your unemployment, to build things better than you can as of today. I understand that you think that this competitor can also build what we can build, but they don't have the same term ability to impose the terms and conditions that we can. So give us some time to come in, figure out what we're doing wrong, and then fix it. 
so that we can maintain this global empire that's worked so well for so many people post-1945. So the money isn't used to buy people off, it's used to buy time. That's the difference between what's worked in the past. And it also, for the most part, can allow these countries some form of independence. So they are, they are dissatisfied and you're giving them a, pol a political voice as well. You try to keep them in a minority party, but you're also in a position where you use that money to maintain the political party that's favorable to you, but at the same time, under a system that gives a minority vo voice a seat in parliament or Congress so that you're bringing them into the fold. And what hasn't worked in the past is when you're trying to shut them down, like say the French in Algeria or you know, all over the world, right? That's been a hammer and nail military approach and it's never worked. And so the political approach, the diplomatic approach has worked. Look at Ireland, you know, um, you know with, with Sinn Féin and so on. So that would be one way to do it, is to use the money, because that's what we have now. That's what empires have, even as they're going down. So use that money to buy time, to try to fix the problems that have, for the most part, been created because of a globalized structure that, that hasn't been able to put everyone on that escalator. And is that what the United States is capable of doing right now? It's questionable, because even the internal political system is not working very well. And so the United States does not have that reputation to be able to walk in somewhere else and say, listen, we've got the best educational system, the best functioning political system. Let us help you. It's quite likely that that argument is going to fail in 2021. And that's what's going to allow competition to come in. If you're a smaller country, what you probably want to do is let both countries in on a limited capacity as possible and let them compete and see who really does have the ability to create better outcomes for you. Is that going to create segregation? Possibly, but you can see why economic segregation oftentimes happens because people are trying to... If you're a smaller country that's dependent on a foreign military to protect you, in many cases, whether you're Costa Rica or somebody else, you have to let in foreign money. And your saving grace is your ability to impose on a reasonable basis the laws and the terms and conditions that allow you to go from making stocks to making semiconductors. That's the goal. China has obviously succeeded. Chinese Taipei, Taiwan, has obviously succeeded. At one point, it was nothing more than an aircraft carrier for the, for the United States military. It's now a vital part of not just the semiconductor manufacturing process, but the shipping routes that are connected to those products. So, that's where we are now. The conclusion, nothing wrong, nothing, nothing inherently wrong with an empire, except that almost all empires eventually decline because they seek a monopoly that for the most part either causes social dissolution or inflation or both as politicians begin taking the path of least resistance over time because that's just what's easier to do.